Good afternoon and welcome to today's session on AHA, that is Ask Him Anything with Mr. Vishal Shah. I am Prasanna, co-host of the event today. It's a unique webinar concept specially designed for enterprise owners and senior IT professionals. Today's session is focused on saving the cost every enterprise spends on Microsoft license, email systems, and cloud backup. Let me introduce today's presenter, Mr. Vishal Shah, CEO and co-founder of Sinosoft Technologies. He has over 18 years of experience and expertise of IT industry. He is known as seasoned technology stalwart, an inventor of specific patented technologies, a writer, a serial entrepreneur, an investor, and most importantly, a go-to guy for MSMEs. Following questions are already taken up on the agenda. The questions are how to measure effectiveness of the sort of technology adoption in the MSME setup, how to logically choose between on-cloud and on-premise deployments to best suit specific MSME setup, how to get through information security compliance requirements for vendor empowerment by customers and government, how to make IT manager more productive in the MSME setup. Uh, Vishal sir, can you please take it ahead from here? Thank you, Prasanna. Uh, good afternoon, all. So we are back with uh, this AHA session. Every month uh, we try to do this and uh, this is Ask Him Anything with Vishal Shah, with myself. So in this uh, particular uh, session, we do not set the agenda. Agenda is derived by your own questions. And how we uh, plan it, I will explain briefly. Uh, so whenever you register, uh, you give your details. Along with the details, you are also mentioning your question. So we study those questions and categorize them in different uh, categories. And uh, we design the question which represents the questions uh, of many other attendees in the same sense. And then we answer these questions one by one. So what we have done in this particular webinar is uh, first I will explain the categories of the questions around what these questions are being asked by enterprise owners and IT professionals. And along with that, uh, we will take every question one by one and uh, I will answer, I will try to answer those questions in my own way in very layman's language. And I will try to make sure that people get a very good answer, uh, which they can actually put to use and benefit for that. So first of all, I would like to understand the profile of the audience so that I can make this particular session more interesting. And I request Prasanna to launch the first poll and we will move to the next slide to understand the categories of the questions and then we will take the questions one by one. Prasanna, please launch the poll. So the question is about the stakeholders. So I am attending this webinar as an owner or custodian of enterprise data or an IT professional or an IT vendor or system integrator. So 13% of the attendees are enterprise owners and 88% uh, are the attendees are IT professionals. So we have a very relevant cloud, uh, crowd and uh, we will take the questions one by one such that it is interesting to everyone who is attending this session. So let us first understand the categories of the question. So most of the questions uh, are around 
how we can make IT adoption more effective. And most of these questions revolved around a return on investment, effectiveness of IT deployment, and notional losses if your IT deployment is not managed well. Under the return of investment, uh, many have asked how they can minimize the hardware investment, how they can minimize the software investment, how they can deal with the expenses on the services like email subscription, cloud backup, cloud service, data center service. In the effectiveness category, uh, most of the questions are pertaining to feature utilization. They buy IT product, but many a times they want to maximize the use of its features and they are revolving around feature utilization. Many questions revolved around very specific complexities, uh, which actually does not allow organization to use the IT solution effectively. And element of democracy means it is all about IT policy. You know, we want to have IT policy. We want to make our users aware about the IT policies. But many a times, users do not follow those IT policies. And those IT policies are just on paper. They are not effectively implemented. So effectiveness pertains to element of democracy in IT policy also. And many have asked about notional losses, which can cause uh, damage to the organization's reputation or business. And one of them was about business continuity. Many of them were about competitive exploitation due to data leakage. And there are so many questions uh, around compliance default. You know, people sign non-disclosure agreement. People uh, have to get through certain audits to uh, comply with customers' requirement on cybersecurity data management. And many a times they default on that because of their lack of IT adoption. And many have asked about how IT can effectively enhance the productivity. So these are the categories of the questions I'm going to take up. Before we start with the first uh, set of questions, I request Prasanna to launch the poll to understand everyone's viewpoint about this genre or categories of the questions. So what concerns you the most uh, and 40% have ref uh, responded that effectiveness of IT systems in operational efficiencies concerns them most. And 60% six, of the people have uh, expressed that return on investment in IT, effectiveness of IT system deployment in operations, avoidance of notional losses due to loss leakage and theft of data are the points which concerns them the most. So. We are going to discuss many questions which will answer everything around effectiveness or effective adoption of IT. So I will move to the first question. So the first question is, how to decide on cloud or on-premise? A lot of buzz we hear about cloud, cloud computing, cloud adoption, virtualization. So many of the times, organizations feel that, you know, they want to evaluate the cloud adoption. Then they are in dilemma whether they should remain on premise or they would they should migrate to cloud. And they, there has to be an approach 
to confidently decide whether what is suitable for the organization, whether it is on premise or whether it is on cloud. So I have answer to this particular question in three parts. First, we have to understand the levels of cloud adoption. And we have to find out which level is the best level for us. And we have to also understand what should be our checklist while finalizing on cloud computing service provider. So first we understand the level of cloud adoption. So the first level of cloud adoption, I'm sure everybody attending this webinar has already adopted it. And that is for email hosting. Most of us use emails on cloud. It could be O365, it could be Google Workspace, it could be Zoho. We use cloud for our email services. So that is a very basic first level of cloud adoption. Another cloud adoption is maintain an off-premise infrastructure and take backup on the cloud. That is another level of cloud adoption where we have off-premise server, we have on-premise uh, on-premise server, we have on-premise uh, NAS box, we have on-premise storage. And then we take the backup of this everything on the cloud and that is another level of cloud adoption. The third level of cloud adoption is whatever applications we use, either we migrate them to the cloud or we start using SaaS services. Like we have CRM on cloud, we might have Tally on cloud, we have SAP on cloud. So we can identify the applications which we use in our operations and migrate them to the cloud infrastructure or contract with software as a service providers and we subscribe to their services as per user per month or per user per year kind of charge model. So that is a third level of cloud adoption. The fourth level of cloud adoption is for file sharing and collaboration. So many a times we keep all our files data on the cloud and we share it with the users. We give them permissions as per our hierarchy and we use file server on the cloud. Google Drive, Dropbox, OneDrive are the examples. So that is another level of cloud adoption. And the last level of the cloud adoption is full private cloud infrastructure. Means we create our own cloud infrastructure on a data center. We host our file server, mail server, application server, storage, everything on the cloud. And we use everything on the cloud. We secure it, we make it private, and we use it through VPN. So these are the levels of cloud adoption. Now the question is, what is best for an organization on premise or cloud? So it depends on the nature of our operations. So when we talk about the nature of our operations, we have to have a logical approach to that. And that logical approach is all about answering certain questions. So the first question we need to ask is, how are our operations distributed across the locations? So we have to understand from how many locations we are operating, a business is operating. We have to find out how many users are working remotely or work from home. And then we have to understand the percentage of users at a single location. So let's say, for example, you are operating from three locations. At one location, you have 40 users, at another location you have 5 users, at another location you have 3 users. Then percentage of the users at the single location is approximately 90% are at one location and 10% are distributed across. So this is the answer to these questions. Now, <clears throat> how we determine whether we require cloud service or not? So it's a very logical thing. If your operations are distributed across the locations or you have large number of users who are remote users. Cloud is something we, which you should think about. But if percentage of users at a single location 
is very high, then you should host your IT systems at that particular location where number of users are largest and rest of the users can connect to that particular location, either through MPLS or lease line. So that would be an on-premise deployment. So for consumers or consumer type of organization, the level of cloud adoption is of course, email hosting, they keep it on cloud. They keep on off-premise backup. They keep application hosting or SAR, uh, use SaaS services. And they also use drive kind of Google drive kind of drives for their cloud adoption. For SMEs, it could be level A, which is email hosting. It could be level B, which is off-premise backup and rest is on-premise. And for large enterprises, it is E, where full private cloud infrastructure is created. It is affordable because the scale of the usage is very large. So we have five levels of cloud adoption, level A, email hosting, level B, off-premise backup, level C, application hosting or SaaS service providers, level D is file or data sharing and collaboration, level E is full private cloud infrastructure. In order to determine to what level we should implement the cloud is first ask how many locations you operate from, how many remote users you have, and what is the percentage of users at a single location? If percentage of the users at a single location is very large, you should opt for on-premise. If number of locations and number of remote users, users are very large, you should go on cloud. And there are three types of organizations. Ones are very micro type of organization, very consumer-like organizations. So they might adopt the cloud at level A, B, C, and D. SMEs who have most users concentrated at one location, they can adopt cloud for email hosting, they can adopt cloud for off-premise backup, and they can keep rest of the things on-premise. And there could be large enterprise, they can adopt the cloud at the E level, where full cloud infrastructure is created for the organization. Now, whenever you are deciding about who could be your cloud service provider, how you select the cloud service provider, you should have a checklist. First of all, check the exit barrier. The exit barrier is if you decide to discontinue the cloud service, how will you get your data or email data or file data or application data back? And that is an exit barrier. How can you migrate to other service provider provided you don't want to continue with a cloud service provider? So whenever you are deciding about a cloud service provider, evaluate their exit barrier policies, evaluate their data policy. How will they return your data? In what form they will return your data? and how easy it is to get the data back and either go back to on-premise deployment or another service provider of the cloud. Another is look at the recurring cost. You look at the recurring cost and can calculate the cost for next five years. And then compare it with the cost of on-premise with next five years. And whatever is more cost effective, you should do that. So another, concern you should have while dealing with a cloud service provider or while selecting a cloud service provider is recurring cost. Third is data leakage possibilities. You need to understand what if you move all your data to cloud and are you really equipped with data leakage prevention? Because when your data is on cloud, it can be accessible from anywhere. And if you don't have efficient data leakage prevention policies, or tools, your data might be leaked and you are you might be competitively vulnerable. So you need to ask that question to your cloud service provider, how they deal with data leakage possibilities. Then price escalation. When you deal with any cloud service provider, you need to fix or lock the price. We have seen in past many instances like Microsoft or Google, they they increase or escalate their prices every year. And then cost of ownership is very, very difficult. And 
because there is a very high exit barrier, people have no choice but to pay those escalated prices. You also need to discuss data integrity with your cloud service provider because all your data is with them. What if they misuse that particular data? I, we have There are so many cases which have surfaced where CRM companies use their customers' data to market their services. So let's say if we have subscribed to a CRM service and we have started adding our customers, they also market their services to those customers. So there has to be a data integrity agreement also and data localization policy. Um, in India, people, I mean, government is going to uh, come up with its data localization policy where Indian company cannot keep its data outside. Most of the cloud service providers either are from US or from the European countries because their cloud infrastructure is already depreciated. It is very, very uh, cost effective compared to cloud infrastructure cost in India. So we have to understand the data localization police policy of the government and we have to find out what are the cost implication to keep our data in, on Indian cloud. So these are the concerns. <clears throat> so this is how we can decide whether what is good for the organization on premise or on cloud by understanding the level of cloud adoption, by asking the right questions and then defining what level of cloud adoption we require. And whenever we want to finalize on any cloud service provider, we have to ask questions about the exit barrier, recurring cost, data leakage policy, possibilities, price escalation, data integrity, and data localization. So this is about the first question we got uh, in form of many questions, which we have summarized it in this, this type of question. So I request Prasanna to launch the poll so that our audience can reflect their views on this particular question. So 63% uh, of the people have uh, expressed that their level of cloud adoption is limited to emails on cloud and on-premise servers for file application and backup. 13% of the people have defined their cloud le level of cloud adoption as email backup, file on cloud, on-premise servers and application, majority of them. And 25% of the people use cloud for emails, backup, files, and applications. So majority of the attendees are on-premise. I hope they can decide whether uh, cloud is good for them or continuing with on-premise is good enough. So now we'll move to the next question. What is IT standardization? There were so many questions around this. So I thought, let me define for everyone's understanding, what do we mean by IT standardization? So IT standardization can be explained in three parts. One is IT policy enforcement. So when organization has an IT policy and it has an approach and method to enforce that IT policy, that contributes to standardization of IT. And that 
contains application controls, admin and user hierarchy, email, internet, and USB policies. I will explain them one by one. So let's say we have an accounts team which requires to use some GST application, ERP application, tally, banking application. Then for that profile of the users, as per the IT policy, they should have access to Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Tally, SAP, whatever software they require. And only those applications can run on their computer devices. And that is what we call application controls. Similarly, if a sales team has to use the IT, then they might require CRM, they might require uh, some proposal application, Similarly, production people might require some inventory management, ERP. So only those applications can be accessible as per the role of the user. So that is what we call as application controls. Second is in IT policy enforcement, we have a very strict discrimination or differentiation between admin and users. So most of the users should be in users category, not in admin category. And admin can define the policies for the users. And third is about email policy, about internet policy, about USB policy. What do we mean by email policy? It means whether a user can send emails outside the organization or only the email system for internal communication. If user can send emails outside, it should be moderated or not. It means it should be approved by the supervisor and then only emails go out if user is handling very sensitive data. Or whenever user is sending an email, he can only send the text, he cannot send the attachments. Or whenever he's sending an email, he can send certain set of attachment extensions only. Or whenever he's sending an email, whether he can send emails and the copy will automatically go to his supervisor, whether he can send blind carbon copy or not. You know, blind carbon copy can be very easily used to leak the data from the organization. So, then internet policy, what kind of websites user is supposed to access? What kind of rights user has to have on internet, upload or download or both? And what kind of policies users can access on USB part? So whether user can take the data out to the USB or they can use USB port only for keyboard mouse kind of uh, uh, kind of keyboard mouse kind of uh, equipments or whether they can use the USB port but only invert the data. So this is about IT policy enforcement. Second part of IT standardization is data management and that is data compartmentalization it means accounts team can see accounts data, sales team can see sales data, technical team can see technical data. So compartmentalization of the data. Then data deduplication. So many a times um, users have a tendency not to delete a file or keeping so many copies of the file. And then there is a problem of the version maintenance of the files. So there has to be data deduplication strategy for the organization. And that is also part of IT standardization and access permission. What data and which user will match with each other. So let's say uh, accounts team can use accounts data, but some of that data is also accessible to sales data, like outstanding payment data. So you have to have access permissions on your data management practices, and that is also a part of IT standardization. And the third one is data protection. What are your policies on your data protection? Now, from what you have to protect your data. So you have to protect your data from accidental deletion, intentional deletion, ransomware, disaster. You have to protect the data. You have to protect the data from being leaked over internet, over USB port, over email attachment. You have to protect your network from external hackers also. So what are your data protection policies? You should have well-defined policies and you should have adequate tools to implement those policies. And that could be backup and recovery strategies documented. It could be VPN and remote application access practices. It could be 
policy about work from home. So when we define all these things in detail, it contributes to IT standardization. So I'm answering this question, what do we mean by IT standardization? So IT standardization is com combination of three things. One is IT policy enforcement in terms of application controls, admin users, hierarchy, email, internet, and USB policies. Another is data management in terms of data compartmentalization, deduplication, and access permission. And the third part is data protection in terms of backup and recovery strategies, VPN and remote application access, work from home and BYOD, bring your own device kind of policies. So when the organization has very well documented policies on all these three parts and adequate tools to enforce this policy, we can say that the IT standardization is accomplished. So this is all about IT standardization. I request Prasanna to launch the poll, please. So on the question about level of IT standardization, 63% have mentioned that only allowed application can be accessed by the users. 38% have user admin hierarchy. 50% have email vigilance and data leakage prevention policies. 88% have USB controls for data leakage prevention. 88% have data compartmentalization and file folder permission. 50% have data deduplication. 75% have backup recovery provision after deletion, ransomware, or disaster. 75% have IT policies on laptop on remote users. And 75% have remote access through VPN and backup of laptop users. So this is the level of IT standardization uh, with our attendees. We will move to the next question. How to increase the productivity of IT managers in SMEs? So this is a very crucial question. Many a times SMEs do not invest in right tools. And because they do not invest in right tools, their IT managers are short of tools. They don't have adequate tools to manage the IT very well. And because of that, the time is wasted on a lot of unproductive activities. So let us, understand what are those unproductive activities and how you organization can invest in right tools, equip their IT professionals to manage the IT in a better way. So most of the times when organization has not invested in right tools, the IT manager's time is wasted on unproductive tasks. One of them is maintenance of multiple hardware. You know, IT manager has to manage a file server or domain controller hardware, then some other hardware, then storage hardware, manage maintenance of multiple hardware. Management of multiple software, you know, Windows server license, client access license, Active Directory, and so many things, you know, one has to manage. Then coordination with multiple vendors, because the hardware is sourced from, from there are multiple hardware, multiple software, there are multiple vendors, and the productivity is lost because of then troubleshooting due to mis mishandling by the users. Because there are no good IT policy enforcement tools, users can 
deviate from those IT policies and they have problems and IT manager's time is wasted on solving those problems which could be avoided by proper IT policy enforcement. Then they have to manually harden the device, means manually allow the applications on the device, manually allow the USB ports on the device or not allow. So a lot of manual activity happens. Then manual backup. Many a times they have to take the manual backup of emails, PST, file data, application data, and that also is very unproductive. They have to back up individual computers because users have a um, choice to save their data on individual computers instead of saving it on the central server. And that adds a lot of overheads for, from an IT, for an IT manager and backup of laptops. Every time they have to take the backup and backup is not available because user is busy or doing some priority task, and they have to continuously chase the users for backing up their laptops. And these are all unproductive tasks. If organization invests in right tools and all many of these things are automated, a lot of time can be saved for an IT manager, which can be well utilized on productive tasks. And those productive tasks is users training or operations management software, how users can use CRM better, how users can use ERP better. So IT managers knowledge can be utilized in educating the users and lift the overall effectiveness of IT adoption in the organization. Then enhancement in ERP and customization ideas, you know, if IT manager is free from all these unproductive tasks, he can actually analyze the software and ERP, interact with the service providers and add certain tools or features such that, you know, operational efficiencies can be enhanced. IT manager, if he's spared from all these unproductivity, unproductive tasks, he can explore new technologies for the organization. He can become proactive in monitoring and reporting instead of keeping in a state of firefighting all the time. So the question about how to increase IT manager's productivity, organization needs to understand what are the unproductive tasks, what are the productive tasks. They have to automate such such unproductive tasks such that it does not consume the IT manager's time and energy. And IT manager is spared to take care of more productive tasks. So I request Prasanna to launch the poll and then we will move to the next question. So as we see the results on the screen, 100%, all the attendees believe that uh, by investing in proper tools and systems, you can increase the productivity of the IT manager. So now we will move to the next question. <clears throat> How to make SME information security compliance ready? See, nowadays, whenever an MSME is doing its business, either they are the suppliers to large enterprises or they are exporters. In both the cases, large enterprises as well as overseas customers, they have empanelment systems and they have certain criteria to which their vendors have to comply. And these criteria also include cybersecurity and IT infrastructure criteria. Many a times, because the MSMEs are not able to comply with those criteria, they fail to get empaneled and they lose business. So, what is the coverage of the compliance? You know, 
So the coverage of the compliance, when we have analyzed so many such questions and criteria shared to us by our customers, which are actually given to them by their overseas or large customers, we have categorized them in a summary, you know, in summarized categories. The first category is about IT standardization and device hardening. They expect that your IT should be standardized and your devices should be hardened so that user can do what is expected from him to do nothing else. Then there has to be some very effective provisions for recovering of accidentally or intentionally deleted data. The customers in their empanelment criteria also expect that there has to be an audit trail with all data or file operations. And in case somebody has deleted the data, there has to be a trail to that particular user. These customers also want proper provisions for the organization to be able to recover data after the ransomware attack. They also want their SME vendors to maintain their business continuity after the disaster also. They also want their SME customers or vendors, sorry, SME vendors to have USB controls to prevent data leakage, email vigilance to prevent data leakage and internet controls to prevent data leakage. So these are the compliance coverage criteria which every MSME has to fulfill if they are, they are exploring any empanelment or vendor empanelment from a large enterprise or an overseas customer. So <clears throat> how or MSME can very rapidly become compliant. So instead of going traditionally to get compliance, which is very expensive, which includes very complex technologies, multiple hardware, MSMEs can opt for IT in a box solutions. So IT in a box solutions give them plug and play compliance. So they buy such an IT in a box solution and they can check mark on all these compliance criteria and they can easily develop their business with larger customers and overseas customers by complying with their vendor empanelment criteria. So this is about how MSME can become cybersecurity compliance. They should not go for a traditional um, route. They should go for a ready-made compliance system. When they go for a traditional route, it requires a lot of hardware, software, multiple solutions to be deployed. Many a times they do not deploy all those solutions. They deploy partially. So they keep investing, but they don't get compliances very well done. So IT in a box solution should be adopted by the SMEs to become information security compliant. I request Prasanna to the launch poll related to this question, and then we will move to the next question. So the question was, what is found most challenging in terms of compliance challenges? So 63% find cybersecurity compliance as challenging one, 50% IT audit by the customer as challenging one, and 25% uh, think that, you know, mandatory vendor, vendor empanelment compliance by government and large enterprises is very challenging. 
So yes, uh, one can look at IT in a box solution and get all these things in plug and play manner. We'll move to the next session, next question. How can we legitimately minimize hardware and software license cost in an MSME? So again, it is about choosing between multiple complex solutions integrated and maintained against single solution. So there are some ideas I would like to express. So traditionally, any organization has to spend on hardware and software license cost hardware as well as software license cost in terms of functions, function specific IT hardware to run function specific software like domain controller hardware runs Windows Server domain controller. File server, NAS and storage, VPN firewall and hardware, terminal server hardware for remote access of the application and application hardware, application server hardware to run the ERP kind of application software. So they have to invest in hardware on which they run the software. So first they invest in multiple hardware, which is domain controller hardware, file server hardware, NAS storage hardware, VPN firewall hardware, terminal server hardware, application server hardware. On this hardware, they run Windows Server Domain Controller. They pay for client access license. They run Windows Server Terminal Server on their Terminal Server hardware. They pay RDP CALS for that. They run Windows Pro OS on individual computers. They uh, use MS Office kind of productivity software. They use MS Outlook like email client and they use G Google Workspace or O365 kind of email subscription services. How you can minimize this cost? So minimization of this cost can be very easily achieved by IT in a box solution which serves as a domain controller, file server, VPN firewall, terminal server, application server, everything. So you can opt for IT in a box solution and avoid purchasing multiple hardware, avoid purchasing multiple hardware. And when you avoid purchasing multiple hardware, you don't have to purchase multiple software also. And accordingly, you can save huge cost. So an IT in a box can act as a domain controller hardware, file server, NAS storage, VPN, firewall, terminal server. Then you save the cost on the hardware part as well as you save the cost on Windows Server domain, uh, Windows Server domain controller, Active Directory, Windows Server terminal server, RDP client, and all of this. For productivity, one can analyze WPS Office, which is very close to Microsoft Office in terms of user friendliness. And they can use Thunderbird instead of Outlook and they can save huge cost. And for minimizing the cost of email subscription service, they can use DNS split technology, popularly known as hybrid email, where they can opt for Google or Microsoft accounts for very important users. And for rest of the users, they can subscribe to secure, reliable, but cost-effective email system. So that is how one can legitimately reduce the cost of hardware and software in an MSME setup. So this is my answer to the next question. Uh, Prasanna, can we move to the poll, please? So as we see the results, the question was, would you like to explore savings in hardware and software costs by innovating IT, innovative IT strategies? Everybody agrees to it. And you can actually opt for this IT in a box solution, WPS Office, Thunderbird, hybrid email technology to reduce the cost. We'll move to the next session. Next question is, what is IT in a box solution? 
So IT in a box solution is a single hardware, single software, but it functions. It functions as a domain control hardware. It functions as a domain controller software. It functions as a storage or file server hardware, which huge capacity, storage capacity. It also functions as a storage or file server software so that we can give access permission to the users. We, have, we can compartmentalize the data. It can also act as a VPN firewall server and software. It also includes endpoint control software to manage USB. It can also act as an email distribution system with mail vigilance. It can also act as a backup software and hardware. It can also act as a remote application access software and hardware, either by virtualization of the application. So traditionally, IT in a box solution suffices as a single in the form of single hardware and software, which can work function as domain controller hardware, domain controller software, storage hardware, storage software, VPN hardware, VPN software, endpoint controls, mail vigilance, backup software, remote access software and hardware. Now your question would be, how is it possible? It is possible because if you look at any function specific software, it has hundreds of features. In MSME setup, most of these features are not used because these features are used for very large scale usage of IT. So IT in a box concept works on rule of 80-20. Means, means 80% 80 of the customers are satisfied with 20% of the features means it fills in the most important 20% of the features of a full-fledged function-specific IT software solution. And it combines all these solutions in a single hardware because there are 20% of the features it can run on a lighter hardware. It is cost-effective and it is simple also. So this is what I would define what is an IT in a box solution? So IT in a box solution is a single hardware, single software with single dashboard. And it has most popular features of a domain controller, of a storage, of a file server, of a VPN, of an endpoint, of a mail system, of a backup software, of a remote access applications. So this is what do we mean by IT in a box solution? So I would request Prasanna to launch the poll before we move to the next session. So the question was, did you know about the benefits of IT in a box? 60% say yes, and 40% learned it today. So we will move to the next particular part. So this was all about the questions which we have categorized and uh, we have some time, people can ask specific questions. I would be happy to answer. So either you can write your questions in question and answer palette, or you can raise your hand 
will unmute your microphone and uh, you can ask the question. Yeah, Mr. Agadi has asked, how is data sync done for remote users? So, see, basically, remote users should connect with your IT infrastructure in terms of file server or VPN, and they should directly use the files from the VPN. They should be given offline folder access and in that offline folder X folder, they can save the data, which they can work offline without connecting to VPN. And instead of syncing the data, you should have a data backup, which should be automatic without intervention of the users. And that data is backed up on your cloud or on your on-premise infrastructure so that if something happens, to the computer system of the remote user. You don't lose the data. At the same time, the user can work on the data offline and can connect to VPN whenever he wants to collaborate with other users in terms of file sharing. So Babura has asked, what is your approach IT on a box versus HCI platform for on-premise setup? See, both are very different uh, in terms of scale of usage. So IT in a box would be sufficient uh, for the networks of 200 users. After that, it may not serve the purpose because an organization which has larger scale of usage will require certain features which are not there in IT in a box solution. So both are different completely different uh, 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 scale of usage. As long as organization is small, it requires less features. It requires, fe it does not require features which are actually required at a very large scale usage. So IT in a box approach would be suitable for a smaller organization, maybe up to 100 users, 150 users. Beyond that, it won't be suitable. So. It depends on the stage of the organization, you should select the solution. Uh, for a smaller organization, HCI platform type of uh, solutions would be absolutely unaffordable and complex. So IT in a box for someone who is small and other for someone who is large. Yeah, any more questions? How robust is data backup, data leak prevention features in black box? What technologies are used for the same? So I'll tell you. Um, we'll, we will, I'll answer this question in two parts. One is related to data loss and another is data leakage. So when we talk about data loss, data can be lost by three different, in three different situations. First, deletion, it could be accidental or intentional. Second, ransomware attack. And third, disaster or hardware failure. Now the first thing first, data can be lost by accidental deletion. In that case, organization has to look at the backup last backup and that last backup may not be a very real time backup it might be yesterday's backup or last week's backup and that is where organization loses business continuity if data is accidentally deleted and they have to restore the last backup they might lose the work in between the time when data was deleted and the time when backup was taken another challenge 
in the same deletion situation is if data deletion is done intentionally. So when, when I talk about black box, it deals with it in with two different approach. One, it captures the data deleted real time. And you can keep the deleted data for number of days. So in case somebody reports that data is deleted, you can immediately recover the data from that capture, not from last backup, and you can continue the business without losing anything. If data is intentionally deleted, black box keeps the file operation logs and you can easily find out who has deleted the data and take the actions. Another is about ransomware. So normally we use uh, antivirus for ransomware protection, either at a gateway level or at the device level. But that is an approach which is a very uh, plan A approach, you know, like vaccine. We take the vaccine and we hope that we will not catch up the disease. But there can be a zero day on which a new ransomware is launched or antivirus at the gateway or at the device is not able to detect it and then ransomware has done its job, destroyed our data. In that case, we need plan B, which is like we have taken the vaccine we hope that we will not catch up the disease, but if we catch up the disease, we cannot take vaccine again to recover from the device. We require medicine. Similarly, if our ransomware protection fails, we should be easily, we should be able to easily recover the data and maintain our business continuity. So black box focuses on data recovery after ransomware attack. And it has primary chamber, hidden chamber technology with DCDC -DC protocol, which is very robust. And uh, in, ransomware cannot attack the hidden chamber by its own protection layers. And in case the organization falls prey to a ransomware attack, the admin can connect to the hidden chamber and get the data back. That is about second uh, situation. Third situation is disaster. So black box has high availability also if you select certain models. And black box can throw your data to cloud backup of your choice, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, or black box data center also. Now coming to data leakage part. So now data leakage can happen by two means. One, by the external people. Another, by the insiders. So black box focuses, there is a lot of development on preventing data leakage by the external hackers. But there is very limited, uh, uh, you know, development done in terms of solutions for insider threats. So black box focuses on insiders threat mitigation. So when we talk about insider threat mitigation, our own users might leak the data on USB port, might leak the data on email attachment, might leak the data on internet. So black box has specific technologies which can control the USB at three different levels. <clears throat> One for using it for keyboard mouse or for inward only communication or for inward as well as outward communication with report. Or it has a very good email policy enforcement tools so that you can make sure that users cannot misuse email systems for data leakage. And third is internet. It has a very signature happy hours feature uh, which automatically isolates the data as soon as the user goes on a website uh, which has a potential uh, data upload facility. So this is how uh, Black Box uh, deals with data loss and leakage. Uh, how can we switch MS Office users to other tools for large size PST email data? There are tools to migrate PST files to Thunderbird files, uh, very, very cost effective tools, and you can very easily migrate them to Thunderbird kind of email clients, and they are very good. Uh, third question is uh, one moment. I lost track. Yeah. Um, let me see. Does other tools support 50 GB, 100 GB large size data? Yes. Yes. My own Thunderbird file is around 300 GB. Last question for ransomware variants, how good is the protection? Is it AI based? See, as I told, black box does not have any protection mechanism against ransomware. We have left it to your antivirus provider. But if your antivirus provider fails to detect the virus or ransomware because it was a zero day or because it was not updated or because it was not renewed and your data is destroyed, Black box conserves your data in its hidden chamber, which cannot be attacked 
by ransomware and hence after being the victim of ransomware attack you are not left with lost data you are you can continue the business by recovering data from the hidden chamber of the black box so it does not protect the data from ransomware per se it does not detect the ransomware that particular task is left on the <clears throat> antivirus but if antivirus fails it will make sure that organization will not lose business continuity by losing the data yeah any other questions thank you yeah prasanna we can conclude the session uh, yeah one more just let me see okay uh, yeah uh, uh, mr satish agadi uh, has asked how can uh, he connect with us yes uh, prasanna will help you uh, prasanna can you uh, please do the needful yes sir i'll get in touch with yeah so you can please conclude the session prasanna thank you sir thank you for such a detailed and knowledgeable session for all of us uh, we have mr sudhir chobe who is co-founder of sunasoft in the panel he looks after the commercial aspects of the organization so this sir i request you to give the concluding remarks yeah thank you prasanna uh, thank you vishal ji for bringing more clarity more visibility and uh, authenticated approach uh, for the adoption of it in the organizations i hope all the attendees would have gained knowledge and information that they are looking uh, forward from this kind of webinar and uh, thank you prasanna for uh, getting time from mr vishal to have this kind of webinar we we'll look forward for further uh, knowledge sessions in the coming months thank you all the attendees for spending time with us for any further information or knowledge you can connect to prasanna or you can have also contact with our local people who are already in touch with you thank you once again thank you very much thank you thank you